Hi, I'm Lara Bennett, and you're listening to Highway Butterfly, the stories of Neil Casal. Neil was a gifted singer, songwriter, musician, and friend to many. He released 14 albums as a solo artist and collaborated on countless projects with other musicians. After his passing in 2019, his friends and family created the Neil Casal Music Foundation to provide instruments and music lessons to students in New York and New Jersey and to support organizations that offer musicians mental health care. One of the featured projects of the newly formed foundation is the tribute album, Highway Butterfly, The Songs of Neil Casal, a sprawling 41 song collection bringing together a galaxy of rock and roots luminaries. We've asked the contributing musicians to share their memories of Neil and their stories of making the record. Highway Butterfly, The Songs of Neil Casal is out now. Purchase the album and learn more at neilcasalmusicfoundation.org. Hello and welcome to Highway Butterfly, the Stories of Neil Casal podcast. Today is our first episode of 2022. I am Gary Waldman. I'm going to be your guest host for today's episode, which features Kenny Roby. Before we bring Kenny on, I just wanted to give a little recap. 2021 was a long and strange year for everyone. And for us, it was an incredible year because we finished the Highway Butterfly album, 41 songs. We managed to get the CD box set together and the vinyl box set, which sadly was delayed through an endless pyramid of production delays. Thankfully, it, that has finally been completed and the vinyl is being manufactured as we speak. And all of you who have pre-ordered it should see it. Um, hopefully within the next four to six weeks is what we're hoping. And a big shout out to uh, Dave Schools, who carried the burden of production delays on his big shoulders and got us to the finish line. And thankfully, it is done and you will see it soon, which is very exciting. And 2021 was just an amazing year for us to put out this record and we launched the podcast and obviously at the end of 2020, we put out Neil's photo book and the support you guys have given us has just been amazing. So I won't go on too long about it, but I could because I really do appreciate everything you guys have done to help this come to life and to bring attention to Neil's music, which, um, has been our main goal and also on the foundation side through your generous support we've been able to help quite a few musicians with uh, physical and mental health challenges and we've also given away um, a large amount of instruments and we have a bunch of that coming up to uh, to kids in schools in new jersey in neil's name and that has just been um, so rewarding and we've got a bunch coming up including uh a gift of ukuleles and an electric bass to the middle school that Neil went to when he was 13 and 14 and first learning how to play guitars. Um, So that has all just been incredible and uh, we're looking forward to keeping this going to a whole other level here in 2022. We have a lot of stuff happening. There are videos coming out um, for songs on the album. Um, we're hoping to do a tribute concert this year as well and some other events, which could be really exciting and, um, just keep this foundation going and make it as good as it can be so we can help other musicians and help aspiring musicians as well. So, uh, enough of my yakking. Uh, we're going to bring on Kenny Roby for, for those of you who don't know who Kenny is, he was a great friend of Neil's. Kenny grew up in South Carolina and eventually in his teens moved to Raleigh, North Carolina and started his music career and eventually formed a band called Six String Drag that made a record, a fantastic record called Hi-Hat, uh, produced by Steve Earle. But I can't even move. I got concrete feet and ocean sleep and the movements that's meeting you. It's just like a tsunami. Take me back. Take me back. I'm blue. Oh, heart's crying. She's been trying to keep me away from you. But take me back. Take me back. I'm blue. 
at that time in the mid 90s steve had a label called e squared uh earl was one e and jack emerson was the other e the uh, sadly departed late great jack emerson but it was a really cool label that steve had formed and he had a bunch of great bands and he signed kenny's band six string drag and helped them make their first record and uh, ties back to Neil because a guy named Brad Hunt, who was uh, the president of Zoo Records, which put out Neil's first album, Fade Away Diamond Time, in 95. Brad loved Neil, and um, Zoo folded, and Brad started a career uh, as a record promoter and a radio promoter, and he was working with E Squared with Steve. And he called me up and said, Ah, oh, you got to hear this band called Six String Drag. I think you'd be great to work with them. So I went down and saw them play in uh, Athens, Georgia, and just fell in love with them. And they're one of the great live bands I've ever seen, uh, and I've seen a lot of bands. And so I've worked with Kenny since then. That was 1997, so we're in our 25-year anniversary here, and Kenny's got a lot of great things happening. He's got a new record coming out this year, and he did a beautiful version of Neil's song, Too Much to Ask, with Amy Helm for the Highway Butterfly tribute album. And so we'll talk about that a little bit and uh, talk about Kenny's friendship with Neil. They also made a record together called Black Riversides, which you can find online. Um, great record, duo record, and they toured throughout Europe for a year or so and um, always just loved playing together. And they were a great pair uh, when they played together and I always loved hearing them play. And so we're going to bring on Kenny. Uh, enough of my yakking, as I said already. So let's welcome Kenny Roby to the Highway Butterfly, the Stories of Neil Casal podcast. All right. Well, hello, Kenny Roby. How are you? I'm good. Hey, Gary. Nice to see you. Uh, we both have guitars on our walls. Uh, mm -hmm. You're a professional. I'm an unprofessional. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a interesting guitar you have there. That's a resonator guitar, custom made by our friend Jake Wildwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a late, I guess, a late 60s Harmony Sovereign that he converted into a, a sort of uh, parts parts caster yeah. uh, resonator. A Frankenstein Rezo. guitar. Yeah, Frank and Rezo. Yeah, yeah and uh, the guitar behind me is a Chitara Patente, a 10-string Italian guitar from 1920 mm -hmm. that Jake also found and sold to me a few years back. Um but enough about him. He's a whole podcast in his in his own realm. He's a lot of episodes. He really is. Mm -hmm. um, well, anyway, I wanted to come on. You are you are one of Neil's great friends and musical partners. So I figured let's chat. Um, you had a long history going back to uh, 1997 with Neil. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned in my intro, I. Uh, Originally got introduced to you via Brad Hunt, who I knew from Neil's label Zoo. And then when Zoo folded, he was working with Steve Earle. And you and your band, Six String Drag, had been signed to E Squared, uh, Steve's label, with Jack Emerson. And Brad said, oh, you should go see these guys. So I flew into Atlanta, and you guys picked me up in a, a busted-up 1970s tour van at the Atlanta mm -hmm. airport and we drove to Athens and uh, you played at a club called the Hi-Hat that night, mm -hmm. which was also the title of your album that you made with Steve, Hi-Hat. Yep. And uh, that was a great night that I'll always remember. And um, after that, I just said to Neil, you got to see this band play. They're one of the great live bands I've ever seen. And that, I, th I don't remember when Neil first met you. I know there was, um, we were in Raleigh. There was a No Depression magazine tour where Hazeldine was playing and mm -hmm. Whiskey Town and um, who else was on that tour? The Handsome Family and oh, yeah. was it the V Roys? No, I, I don't know if I don't think the V Roys were on that. It's on that tour. Yeah, I don't know. It, it Maybe a couple other people. I'm not sure. I feel like that's when because you came to the show. I might be wrong about this sequence, but Neil was in Florida and he was coming back to drive to New Jersey and he came through, he timed it so he could come and see that show. And I feel like that's when you met him. I think that's also when he met Ryan, but uh, I don't know. What's your memory so. of that? Yeah, it's Does that uh, sound right. Like, yeah, it's it sounds right <laughs> enough. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah. And, and at first I thought it was 96, but 
I guess what you and I did meet, it, I guess it was early 97 because we started um, uh, working with you uh, when Hi-Hat came out. I'm pretty sure it was 97. Um, yeah, so it, it was later that summer. Maybe. Yeah. And um, and then uh, I think you might have met Neil and briefly, and then maybe a month or two later, I think you and Six String Drag were playing at the brewery there in Raleigh. And mm -hmm. Neil and I got in a, a tour van owned by another band, that band that I just mentioned, Hazeldyne, mm -hmm. that was parked in my driveway while they were on tour <laughs> in Europe. And we got in their van and we drove down 12 hours down to Raleigh from New Jersey and uh, saw that show, which was an amazing show. And uh, at the time, Neil was about to get married to a wonderful lady named Christy Coleman. And mm -hmm. they, were, they were together from 92 to 2000 or so and married for three years, I believe. And uh, Neil saw you guys playing and he was like, you think they would play my wedding? <laughs> and uh, of course you said yes and uh, i don't mm -hmm. know two months later you came up to new jersey slept on the floor at my house and played an amazing event <laughs> his wedding which sadly i don't think there's any video of and it was such a great night and there's no existing video of it which... one of the few times that you wish there was you know cell phones <laughs> smartphones and cameras everywhere because that would have been i don't know uh, you know, not to contradict myself, in some ways it's kind of more fun. The memory of it is probably, yeah. you know, more amazing than the actual footage would have been or seeing it. You know, I mean, it would have been cool, but like the experience uh, was just amazing. It was all, you know, Neil and Christy's friends and all y'all's friends and a bunch of musicians. I think it was a bunch of people sat in it was like jack petrozelli right was there jack of course john um, ganty and ganty and uh it was a really good blues harmonica player that oh was yeah called. yeah el rancho um, mike santos yeah. uh, and uh the and a couple other people so neil sat in with us and played on i think he played guilty i want to i can't i can't believe i remember that but i think he did he played uh and we borrowed like a bunch of his gear and everybody's gear and guitars and stuff. And uh, yeah. I think he played a telly that night. He was playing, we were both playing tellies, I think. Or maybe I played it, he played my telly and, or something and I played acoustic. But yeah, I think we did a couple of our songs. And then at the end, after we'd kind of done a set or set and a half or so, everybody started jumping up on stage with us and, uh, or not stage, whatever, and the, <laughs> up against the wall on the carpet. And uh, oh, I remember we did, I think we did like a 25 minute version of Slipping and Sliding. Uh, <laughs> it was great. It was fantastic. Yeah. Like just, yeah. it, it, it sounded great. It was so fun. It was so casual. Everybody was having such a great time. It's one of the best shows that I've ever played in. It was one yeah. of those, one of those uh, things where like, you don't see that many shows where it's just perfect from beginning to end. Like the, somehow the sound was perfect in there. It mm -hmm. was in an old abandoned restaurant in uh, Northwest New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, so there was no PA system or stage. And I'm pretty sure our friend Terry Loftus brought in yeah. a PA system and mm -hmm. somehow it sounded perfect in there. I don't know yeah, how it, it was happened. Mostly, I think it was mostly just, it was good old amps and gear and good drums and Ginty yeah. set up and, and you know some some good players sitting in and and yeah. i think he probably just ran the acoustic and the vocals through the pa and that was it yeah and it's small room you know we gotta love small rooms so it's yeah. great you know where you don't have to deal with cavernous sound and things bouncing everywhere and you can just get the sound that's coming off the stage and you know yeah it's a kind of a day it was kind of a, a dry room i think i think it had carpet and low ceilings probably had drop ceilings so it just kind of just kind of snuggled the sound up yeah nice. and and it was also like uh of course they were going to get married outside by this lake which was next to this restaurant and of course it was the rainiest day of 1997 so oh, that it was cold <laughs> rainy it was nasty yeah but what a great night that was and then shortly after that i guess i i don't know how the idea came but it was just like ah oh, kenny and neil should make a, or should play together or maybe it was mm -hmm. I, actually i think maybe it was neil was going to tour in the uk and scotland and paris and a couple mm -hmm. other places and I think we invited you to open the shows. And then it was like, oh, what if we, uh, what if they, if you guys made a little record together that we could mm -hmm. print up and sell at the shows to help pay for the tour? 
And back in those days, I had a CD burner. And uh, mm-hmm. I think you came up and you stayed at where Neil and Christy lived out in uh, western New Jersey. And Yeah, they had just moved into that old 1700s farmhouse out there. Yeah. And they had, there was a kennel on the, on the, like, somewhere out in the backyard. There was an old dog kennel that Neil had turned into a little recording studio. And, With no uh, heat, mind yeah. you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and it was a concrete, like, block building. Yeah, with, like, concrete floors and, yeah. It yeah. Was, it was brutal. I saw pictures of that um, recently. That I don't know if you'd taken them, but Christy had them and yeah. sent me some pictures of the pictures. And, uh, and we're, li- like, Neil and I are literally, like, strumming our guitars with gloves. And <laughs> it looks like we had done big bong hits because there's so much smoke coming out of our mouths. <laughs> so, so much from the cold air. It was hilarious. Um, and, and the funny thing is it wasn't staged. I think we sat in there and recorded like that. You know, I think the, the whiskey kept us warm, you know. <laughs> I can tell that you've been hurt pretty bad You are looking for a shoulder I found out that other people's tears Just seem to make me older I'd like to help with your broken heart But really I think it's a crime Ain't got the time Ain't got the time all that I can give you is a well wish I hate to be that way I know that it's selfish Baby, I got a destiny to me I know it's on down the line Ain't got the time Ain't got the time well, you made a little a little record which is not available, and it has the uh, very entertaining title of "Not So Low," <laughs> since mm-hmm. it wasn't solo for either of you, and you all mm-hmm. it also was L O W, not so, not so low. low. It was kind of low, but not so low. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that was great, and that led so then we printed up a bunch of those, and so maybe a hundred of them um, mm-hmm. cut out. I think little... like sixty of them turned out because you know back in the day. With those CD burners, like you would get halfway through burning something and they would have an error code and you'd have to throw the CD away and it wouldn't yeah. work, you know, or you yeah. go back and you had, you had to check all of them. You had to listen to all of them to see yeah. if they worked back in the day. Yeah. We have it so good now with that. Oh, we really do. I, I remember when I got that CD burner, like Neil was, I don't know, I think at that point he'd made like four records. And so I made a Neil CD box set of his greatest hits and like spent like days like trying to press up these CDs that never like they were always fail. Oh, brutal. Yeah. yeah. But and I think the, we, when we went on the, the, to Europe, we, we, I think we sold them out in like two or three nights. We're like, yeah. oh, we should have made more. Yeah. Uh, well, there are some great recordings of those, of those concerts, which at some point we'll, we'll have to put one up. But, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I don't know. What do you remember? I know there. I came on part of that tour. I, I missed the infamous uh, Paris gig, <laughs> but I, I did come uh, along for those first few shows in the UK, which we had a lot of laughs. And those shows were really fun. And you guys playing together, of course, was great. Um, what, what do you What do you remember about that? Well, as far as the shows, uh, I was I was kind of sh- shocked a little bit that people like really listened. Because I was used to playing in the States where if you did play solo, you were playing in a bar a lot of times. They didn't have listening rooms very much. And the audiences were, you know, there to, to drink for the most part. And it wasn't, you know, you know, there weren't, there weren't as many, there weren't house concerts as much in the States in the 90s. And, and there, there wasn't like many small listening rooms. There were, there were bigger places and theaters and big concerts, quote unquote, but but not just uh, places where you can play to 50 to 150 people where they'll really listen. And I was very uh, pleased and surprised and actually uncomfortable that people were paying attention so much uh, because I just wasn't used to that. And, and also I wasn't, I wasn't incredibly used to playing solo. I played so much with the band. I hadn't really, it was my first solo record and the band had broken up and and during the band time, you know, I'd play acoustic sometimes, but it would be the band or Rob and I would do a duo thing on the radio. But people didn't 
uh, at least in my circles, we weren't playing out solo very much. And uh, so that was, it was a good experience. Um, and uh, a little bit nerve wracking, like I said, because people were paying attention so much. And, and one of the things that I, the many things I admired about Neil was just his, his guitar playing prowess and his, his, his acoustic guitar playing. I know that a lot of people uh, that know Neil through Ryan and through CRB and uh, hardworking Americans and and circles around the sun know him as an elite electric player. But um, Neil was a fantastic solo player, uh, self accompanist uh, on guitar, and he always had great ideas too for different chord arrangements and capoing and stuff. He's really really good at that and tunings. Uh, just the consummate, you know, uh, accompanist for himself and for me and other people. Um, so it was so great to play with him every night. We would, uh, as you saw some, we would play in Europe and, um, uh, every night in Europe we would, uh, I would do a set and he, I think sometimes he would get up there at the end of my set and do a song or two with me and then he would do his set and then I would get up in his encore and we would do each other's songs and covers and Lubin Brothers and stuff like that. just always great to to have him play it along with me it just kind of lifted you up he was he was just so good at that and uh he made you feel comfortable and uh i go back and listen like i listen to we'll talk about it black river sides or not so low um i assume we'll talk about black river sides but uh you know i listen to the playing of him and i together and and sometimes i would i would think oh man that's really cool what neil was doing there and I realized that wasn't Neil. It was like what I was doing and not toot my own horn, but what I'm saying is he made me so comfortable and he covered so many cool areas that, that I could relax and like do things that I normally couldn't do when I'm just playing by myself, if that makes sense. He kind of freed me up in a lot of ways to kind of be myself. And, and I think it was a lot of fun to play with Neil. Um, yeah, he was. He had a, a a really amazing feel on acoustic guitar. So you see a lot of people play acoustic guitar, and it, it, a lot of great players. Mm -hmm. Neil had something that was just. It was. Um, I don't know what the word is. Smooth in one way, um, but he had a certain tone that he would get from either the way he he uses pick. Or just mm -hmm. just a certain feel that he had was very very beautiful the way he played. Um, I really miss hearing him play because you know he would you know you'd sit around with Neil and he'd play acoustic guitar and he was just it was just so tasty sounding and he was never never do anything that was just I don't know I mean you know he could get crazy and stuff but he just had such a sure. good good feel. And uh, yeah, the two of you guys together were, were great, sounded great on guitar. And after that tour, yeah, you came back to the U.S. And I remember it was summertime. And we were like, oh, we've got to make a record of that. That was so amazing. And we can't keep trying to print up these records on our own. <laughs> um, so we decided to go to uh, 
a place in Chester, New Jersey called Bernie's Hillside Tavern, which is still there. It's a legendary uh, kind of saloon roadhouse. Mm -hmm. And we set up a little recorder, and the same guy who set up the PA system at Neil's wedding, Terry Loftus, brought in a recording system. And uh, you guys, with some help from John Ginty, played a played a couple sets, and we recorded that and turned it into the Black Riversides album, which I think is an awesome album. I know at the time we were like, ah, oh, there was so like there was something special about Not So Low that we don't have on here. Mm -hmm. But I listened back to Black Riversides, and I I just think it's great. Um, yeah, I, lo I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It was something different. It was, you know, there was like eight or nine people. I think uh, just a few <laughs> friends were there. I think like uh, 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 my, I think my brother, my brother's brother-in-law was there. And uh, I think, and I, th I think Van Alston was there because Van oh, yeah. and I had gone up to see the Yankees play. And well, we'd gone up to see Springsteen at the Meadowlands. And, uh, and we also, the same day we went to see a Yankees game in the afternoon. So we Amazing. had a full on New York day and then we rode the buses over, over to the Meadowlands. <laughs> I guess it was Continental Airlines arena. Um, it was giant, it was giant fans. stadium. Was what? it an outdoor no, game? No, it was indoors. What? Oh, it was indoors. No, yeah. it was indoors. Yeah, it was at the, yeah. where the, I guess where. The Continental where, Airlines Arena was, the was originally, played. originally the Brendan Byrne Arena. Oh, that yeah. Was the, he was the governor of New Jersey that got the, uh, the Meadowlands Complex approved back in the gotcha. 70s. Yeah. Then so I just, they, Van, I remember Van and I, you know, riding over to, there and back on those buses with all Springsteen fans. And, if you think it's insane riding on buses with like sports fans to a stadium, like ride with a bunch of drunk Springsteen fans and Van and I were sober, you know, I mean, not that we were sober normally, but we were sober that day and that evening for the most part. And it was just like people howling Springsteen songs, like dogs <laughs> baying at the moon. It's so terrible. And it, and it was, it was, it was bad enough on the way, but it was exciting. But on the, on the drive back and the buses, just the, the, the drunkenness yeah. and the, the, the off key singing, like wailing of everybody. Somebody would just start singing one line from a song and it was like a hundred people on the bus knew like every word. Oh yeah. And yeah. Van and I just kind of had our heads between our legs, just like, Lord, please make this stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was the uh, uh, New Jersey and Springsteen fans is a combustible situation. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was a blast, and it was a lot of great stories. But anyway, yeah, I think the next two nights after that is when we did the, the Black River Sides recording. Yeah, yeah, I love that record. And then... Uh, over the years, you you and Neil cross paths. You were making solo albums. Neil was uh, became a cardinal there a few years mm -hmm. after that. And uh, I know then, um, you know, you, we always thought like you guys would work together and do something eventually. And so mm -hmm. then, then you know, it must have been in I don't know. Was it early late two thousand eighteen or was it early two thousand nineteen? Circles around the sun came and played in Raleigh. And yeah. I was there with him, and you came to the show. And at that point, you had just started um, writing a bunch of songs for a prospective new solo album. And mm -hmm. you'd sent me a couple, and I'd said to Neil, mm -hmm. man, you got to hear these songs. And I think you sent Neil a couple tunes, and he was like, I, I mean, I'll let you tell the story, but I think he just flipped out because over the years, you know, I would always send Neil everything you did, mm -hmm. even if, you know, you guys weren't in contact, I'd always yeah. be like, well, we listen to this Kenny record. And I know he really loved, uh, rather, rather not know. Yeah. And, and uh, he, yeah, he really loved memories of birds. I remember after that came out, he was, he emailed me a couple of times about memories and birds and really loved all the strings and arrangements and stuff on it. And I think he was, he was really into that. Yeah. Which came out in 2013, but yeah. So he, um, yeah, he, uh, you know, we had, we had talked for years, um, you and I, and then Neil and I, every once in a while, we're like, oh, we still got to do something together. We got to do something together. And, uh, we just, it just never worked out. He was always, uh, he had a lot, a lot of time he was touring with the Cardinals and then he joined CRB and did the hard work and Americans thing. And I was doing my own thing and 
during that time, Six String Drag had gotten back together for a few years, uh, starting in 2014. And um, we, uh, well, like I said, I, I, I sent you a few demos I'd made on the iPhone. I think it was Old Love and one other song. And you had f passed them on to Neil after I'd seen him that night. And he's, uh, and he goes, man, I really, really dig these new songs, man. They're, re they're really good. And then I sent him, I think I sent him, I said, well, I got another one I want you to hear. And I uh, went upstairs at a friend of mine's place where I was living at the time. And I sent him a, uh, um, and I made a quick demo of it. And I really had never even played the song. I just had this stream of consciousness song and then I'd written it down and I kind of hummed it a little bit and never like sang it or anything. And like the demo that he heard was me like the second take of me trying to figure out what this, how this song goes. And uh, I sent it to him. And then he later that day, he, he was, I, I keep my phone a lot of times on like do not disturb as far as getting rings. And he, uh, and I see that like Neil's like calling me and which is rare. Cause like Neil didn't usually pick up, you know, it's like text for me and him and a lot of people, a lot of times he didn't pick up the phone, um, uh, and call and, uh, and then text also, you know, you text him in here back two or three days later and vice versa. And so uh, it wasn't yeah. so immediate, but he, uh, he, I forgot, I can look through my texts and, you know, give you the quote if you wanted it, but he just said, uh, he was like, man, holy shit, uh, this song is next level for you. He said it's, uh, he said it's, uh, he said it's, it's right up there with Towns Van Sant style writing or, or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. he said, man, it's like Towns. It's like, it's like, it's, you've, you've hit a new plateau or a new level or something like that. Uh -huh. And, uh, of course, very flattering. Um, yeah. and, and then, so he had called and, and. One of them, I think he left a message like, Kenny, give me a call. And I wish I would have kept it. You know, I, I think I deleted it a little back then if I would have known. Um, and, and I looked again and he texted me again. He goes, man, I don't know in what way you would want me involved in this, but he's like, I'll walk across the country through and through barbed wire to work on this record. These songs are so great. And I want, you know, it was like, a lot of hyperbole, you know, just like me, Neil could get up there with the hyperbole, but you know, he was super, ex you know, he wasn't lying. He was, could get really excited. And, yeah. uh, one of the ways, one of the reasons why Neil and I got along a lot of times, we just like, you know, we're songwriters and I guess we're sensitive enough and all that kind of stuff, but we're all st also still, uh, outgoing gregarious people, you know, yeah. and, and excitable. Um, and so, Anyway, I called him and he said the same kind of stuff. He was like, well, man, I don't know what, you know, what you're interested in doing. He said, anything I can do to help. If I, if I, if you want me to produce it, I'll produce it. If you want me to play on it, I'll play on it. If you want me to produce it and not play on it, I'll, I'll do that or vice versa, whatever. He said, if you want me to just find someone who will help you produce it and put it out, I'll do that. Whatever it takes, I want people to hear this. And so we just started talking after that and it was great because uh, you know, we agreed we were going to work together again, and uh, it was nice to be in contact with him again more. Uh, we were, and like the old days, one of the fun things about traveling around in Europe together was just turning each other on to music and listening to cassettes that we'd made or that we'd bought, and uh, sitting in the back seat while Pier Angela and, 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 uh, Vicky was, and Vicky <laughs> would drive around. They were the tour managers, and, and they booked the tour as well and they uh we would just drive them around drive around and make them play this stuff and from the back seat we're back seat djs and just put this in put this in turn this up <laughs> um and just driving around and neil rolling up you know hand rolled uh european cigarettes and me desperately looking for um pot in england and that was tough at the time um yeah. <laughs> but uh so I made up for it in drinks, um, <laughs> as Neil can attest and you can attest. But anyway, um, so, yeah, so it was nice to be back in touch with him and texting about music and sending each other links of, of records that we thought would be uh, a good way to, you know, good road to go down. And one of those, 
conversations was about uh, Bobby Charles. And uh, we both loved the, and, and the band's second record. It has been really dry, early 70s records, just big and fat and dry yeah. and up close and you could hear everything and everything had its place and it wasn't really affected and it, 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 everything was very simple and just get good players and let them do their thing and um, not tons of overdubs. Neil wanted to, um, you know, wanted to do a little, I want to do it a little more live than Neil did, but you know, we, we, were, we were going back and forth and compromising about that. But uh, we uh, decided to do it at, um, was it Panoramic in California? Yeah, it's a place where they'd made some CRB records. So I know Neil was excited about bringing you out there, getting a band mm -hmm. together to help you make those songs. And mm -hmm. uh, tragically, he took his life and yeah. it didn't happen. Um, yeah, and it was supposed to, yeah, it was supposed to be about um, three or four weeks yeah. after, uh, after it was supposed to be the, the Oddly enough, the week of his memorial show at, um, that we did at um, the Capitol in Port Chester, New York, um, was the week that we were supposed to be making my record, which yeah. is kind of strange. It um, is kind of strange. Yeah, um, I think it was planned. But uh, luckily, Dave Schools appeared and took the baton from Neil and helped you make a beautiful mm -hmm. record called The Reservoir and I think uh, it was a really special night um, the night of the tribute concert we had for Neil which was September 25th 2019 and um, that night you I feel like you and Dave really bonded and that was when you guys I think really the next day you went into rehearsals for the Reservoir album camped out in Woodstock and made that beautiful record with uh Jeff Hill and Tony mm -hmm. Leone and mm -hmm. John Shannon, Jesse Acock. All our friends are gathered round in our old church, singing further along, but on the wind, with our hats and our fans and our hearts in our hands, as we sing our last bitter sweet goodbye. The silver moon is fading in the darkness On the night that we chose to say goodbye Just a sliver of the nail on the last of the fingers Holding on before it slips into the sky Holding on before it slips into the sky interesting that we ended up doing it in Woodstock when Neil and I were referencing Bobby Charles and those band records and we ended it up we ended up doing it um, you know uh, with Tony Leone playing drums who has an association with uh, with Levon Helm and played with Levon's band sometimes and um, and and used to be in a band with Amy Helm and and Jeff who plays with Amy sometimes and um, also that we did it at Applehead recording here in Woodstock which you know some of the gear and baffles and gobos and things like that um, that were at Bearsville studio where a lot of those cool records were made in the early and mid 70s um, uh, were done so so it was really cool it kind of came around yeah um, and uh, and it's a beautiful record and and then after after you made that record, I think a couple months later, you got back together with the band in the studio and too much to ask Neil's song from uh, his album, Anytime Tomorrow. I think that you had a special connection to that song because I, is it, was he writing it when you guys were on tour together? You had a real feel for that song and it's one of his great, great songs and uh, I was so happy that you got to record that one and uh, and bring in Amy. But uh, tell us about that, about Too Much to Ask. Yeah, I, we Neil and I did one of his songs, and it's on Black River Sides, um, called Town Fathers. And it's still, it has that same kind of acoustic waltz feel that Too Much to Ask 
has, and I can't remember, I really, uh, I'd be a liar if I said, yeah, I heard him writing too much to ask, but it was messing around. You know, it's with so sometimes with songwriting, it's like you start messing around with stuff and you hear little things of him when he would like do a sound check or whatever, you know, and it's like, is that Town Fathers? Is that, you know, and so it had such a Town Fathers feel and, you know, I, he might have been messing with it, but it wasn't like he played me like, hey, I have this new song I want you to hear. Yeah. Um, but, it, but I definitely, you know, uh, feel like I heard the, the early stages of that song being born. And then when I heard it, I was like, oh yeah, I've heard this song before. When I heard on, uh, what was it? Anytime tomorrow? Yeah. What? Was yeah. It? It's um, the last song um, anytime tomorrow. Uh, and I loved it and I love that record. Um, um, his record anytime tomorrow. Um, I love the feel, I love the playing, I love the songs on it. I, um, I liked the, the ways he was stretching out a little bit um, uh, with writing and arranging. And so, yeah, when you uh, got in touch with me about um, that you guys were going to do the tribute, um, it, it was it was the song I wanted to do. It's the song that I did at um, at the at his memorial at the cap. Uh, I did a. Um, a medley of it and dolphins by Fred Neal that Neal was a big, uh, yeah. Neal Cassell was a big Fred, fan of Fred Neal as well. And so was I, so it kind of just worked out. It, it's kind of, uh, uh, fit together, but, um, so yeah, we got together to do a, uh, a, a video recording, a live video session with some songs uh, from the reservoir with the guys. Um, from the reservoir band and and we're gonna do too much to ask as well at that time and so we we cut it with the same guys that were on the reservoir and it was great um we, originally we were supposed to go to to um out suppliers and work with jim scott and dave schools and you know tony and jeff were probably going to play drums on, drums and bass on it and we weren't sure who else was going to play on it but we couldn't really do that due to the pandemic and we were just all going to be you know in town and working on the those live videos for for my stuff so yeah um yeah so it was great to be able to do it and then i went back and um did redid the vocal did a, a, a overdub vocal and uh we had a horn section come in and they and them and i arranged the horns uh for it and uh, Amy Helm came in and did the background vocals with me, and uh, we were very fortunate that she did that. She did a beautiful job, and uh, her and I um, worked well together. I, th I think we sing well together. Um, uh, she's also on my new record um, that I just finished. So. Hmm. And you've made a beautiful video for Too Much to Ask as well, which uh, we managed to... Uh, up here in Woodstock right when the mm -hmm. fall was in beautiful uh, beautiful fall weather and we did get to get uh, the whole band Jesse John mm -hmm. um, Jeff and Tony and even Amy came out for that video mm -hmm. shoot and the horn players the who horn played section. the horns yeah so mm -hmm. um, that video has just premiered and we'll show you a little clip of it right here it's just too bad that I won't be around. Now, plain Jane, send me flowers or a postcard. I won't turn you down again. Down with the door. 
just being alive Is enough So that's, uh, um, you can go to Neil Cassell's YouTube channel and watch the whole video or check it out on uh, our social media channels as well. But it's, uh, it's an amazing video and uh, obviously living up here in Woodstock has been amazing and and uh, I've been up here you've been up here since since the tribute concert you came to record the Reservoir album here and you never left and now yeah. I've been up here for about a, a year and a half as well and uh, I, I really I really do miss Neil for Neil would have loved it here Neil would have loved spending mm -hmm. time here he did uh, he made a record with Sarah Lee Guthrie and Johnny Ariane oh, yeah um, and they recorded up here, and I know Neil loved it up here. It's it's uh, it's a bummer. It'd be great to have him around right now, but uh, yeah, that's not to be. Yeah, um, it would. Yeah, but um, this your version of Too Much to Ask just turned out beautifully, and uh, thank you for that thank one. You. And uh, so you've just made a, another record as well, uh, which I, th I think you've just finished. And and you managed to wrangle up. I, we didn't get Dave Schools back out here, but we did manage to get Jeff and Tony. And yeah, the new record is is Tony and Jeff on bass and drums and Dana Littleton, um, who has played with a lot of people. Um, uh, but he, uh, he plays with them, Amy Helm and a lot of the Midnight Ramble folks a lot, as well as on other records and uh, other live gigs. But um, he's a great guitar player, and um, and that's that's and and Amy sings on it. And that's, there's not too many. Um, there's not a lot of uh, folks on it. Hmm. Um, uh, Brian Mitchell plays accordion. Uh, Amy Labor plays some uh, auto harp on it, and uh, that's mostly it. It's a real yeah. stripped down band. Well, it's a, uh, actually, uh, we'll give everybody a little treat. Here's a little piece of a song called New Day. If I take it easy on the water And don't burn in the sun It'll rise slow and steady like it ought to What's begun has begun today is a new day there can be no other day no award. your movement yes you do record as well so if anybody is uh, interested mm -hmm. in helping out just go to kennyroby.net no oh, yeah yeah kennyroby.net and mm -hmm. uh and you can check out the campaign if you want to want to help kenny out mm -hmm. this year with uh, getting this record done and out um it's a it's a great sounding record and this song new day you actually managed to you got amy helm on it and uh mm -hmm. you've got a uh, the legendary john sebastian on there oh, as yeah. well how, yeah, did how, that, how did that, that, that how did that come about um, he knows Dan Littleton and, you know, John's a guy around town. So, you know, I, I hadn't known him, but, you know, he, he knows Amy and he, and, uh, and, um, 
and Chris Bittner, who recorded the record, who also recorded um, uh, the last record, The Reservoir at Applehead, uh, had worked with John before. But but Dan Littleton got in touch with him and he said, hey, man, I think you'll like these songs if you're interested in coming to play in some harmonica. And uh, I was thrilled. It, it was a fantastic experience. It was, you know, we spent half a day in the studio, uh, him overdubbing harmonica on some songs and... He seemed to really like it. He had a really good time. He was, he's a great guy and, and has so many stories. Uh, you could just sit here and, and listen to him all day long, um, tell stories about the, the old times and all the experience he's had. It's pretty amazing, all the Tim Harden records and Fred Neal rec recordings. And, you know, he played harmonica on Roadhouse Blues by The Doors and <laughs> it, his own solo stuff and then all the old blues masters that he's played with like Mississippi yeah. John Hurt and, and uh, gosh Lightning Hopkins it's just a, I mean wow he, he's got many a story and, and all the Love and Spoonful stuff of course so um, yeah so he played on I think he ended up being on three songs on the yeah. record that, that we kept it's so, great a great experience um, and one other thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that you have also been a helping out with the foundation and your particular job has been reaching out to schools in New Jersey and New York so that we can donate instruments to them. And you've uh, done a great job locating schools and figuring out what their needs are and then we've gone down and uh, made some presentations to schools and we've got a bunch more coming up. So uh, how, how, do you, how do you figure that stuff out? Oh, that's kind of <laughs> hard. Um, um, uh, just the emailing a lot of schools and trying to get in touch with them. It's, it's surprising, as you know, how hard it is to try to get um, people on the phone and to reply to emails, even when you're trying to give them something. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think they're so busy in schools. And also, there's so many uh, people trying to sell them something under the, the, the guise of, of, of yeah. giving them something. And so it's, you know, you have to try to make connections and network. And a lot of the stuff that we've had has been from one school telling somebody they know at another school about something and get in touch with me. Um, but it's a great experience. Um, uh, I know Neil would have loved this about the foundation. And um, it's it's really important to, to all of us who are involved to kind of make this. I mean, uh, obviously, the tribute record is amazing and the work is amazing. And, and I love that we're, everybody is putting so much into getting Neil's music heard because it needs to be heard. And, um, but I think that Neil would be just as happy that we're kind of doing something that's bigger than Neil with the foundation. That's, that's about, uh, doing something that's bigger, um, than, than, than promoting his music. Um, uh, th 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 something that can last a long time and, uh, to be able to change, uh, the lives of a kid who's struggling like Neil did so much growing up as we both know uh, yeah. with stuff with his parents and and just the how hard it was growing up and dealing with uh, mental issues and 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 just the the trouble of adolescence uh, you know music can save somebody's ass a lot of times especially a kid you know who kind of doesn't feel like they're a part of anything and and uh, it it can form a sense of community with them. It can it can make them feel a part. It can let them tap into something bigger than themselves. It can give them sort of a Zen way to sort of get away from their thoughts. And as you and I know, just sitting around playing yeah. guitar, um, it, it's meditative. It's uh, it it's it's good for the brain. Um, I don't have to you know this is all over the internet and the books. I don't yeah. have to expand on it too much. But it, it's just really important. I think that um, gosh, if if if, if one kid, it saves one kid's ass or saves their life even because yeah. they have that, that, um, the refuge of being able to play music and they have an instrument when maybe they couldn't, um, and have, and even just, uh, you know, the sense of ownership of just owning these instruments in the schools. And I don't know, I, I, I could go on forever. It's, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. And, yeah. and the fact that we can also, in the foundation, you and others can help get money to uh, and resources to people struggling with mental health issues and being on the road and yeah. the, the struggles of being in the music business and uh, with addiction issues and physical and mental stuff. It's fantastic. I, I think it's, uh, I think the sky's the limit 
And um, yeah, I think Neil would keep be. Pushing it. Yeah, he would be. He would be. Uh, he would be really happy. I think that we've been able to help some musicians and also to get some instruments in kids' hands. And you know, he did say that in his farewell letter to try to help people that are going through some of the same issues he was going through. So uh, that's mm -hmm. what we're going to try to keep doing. And thank you for your help in that. Thank you for the oh, beautiful version pleasure. of Too Much to Ask. And no, uh, Thanks for asking me to do it. Yeah. And uh, I'll look forward to people getting to hear your music if they weren't familiar with it. And for the people who are familiar with it to uh, get ready for another great album that you're putting out hopefully in June. And, yep. Uh, and that will come out on our uh, friend Kevin Calabro's Royal Potato label. Uh, mm -hmm. Kevin is one of the true, the true uh, last great indie labels who help out wonderful musicians to put out records. So that's great. Absolutely. Well, cool, man. All right. Well, uh, careful out on the roads out there. It's going to be really cold this weekend. Thanks. You too. And, uh, thanks for coming on. Okay. This podcast is brought to you by Backline, the music industry's mental health and wellness resource hub. Launched in 2019, Backline gives artists, crews, and their families quick and easy access to mental health and wellness resources. Backline provides individuals with case management and offers virtual support groups as well as yoga, meditation, and breath work. To donate, learn more, or get in touch for personalized care, Visit backline.care. That's B A C K L I N E dot C A R E. Highway Butterfly at the Songs of Neil Casal is out now. Purchase the album and learn more at Neil Casal Music Foundation dot org. Osiris.